Good afternoon, everyone. We're uh, going to go ahead and get started. It's, uh, I think it's 440, and uh, I think Eric and I sit between you and cocktails, so we want to, uh, to stay on schedule here. My name's Al Brandt. This is Eric Vaughn. We're both from Block Ledger. We are uh, community contributors to Hyperledger Fabric, have been around this space since version 0.6. So we have uh, quite a bit of experience with Fabric. And we have focused our company on document-centric processes and using blockchain to leverage the digitization of those document-centric processes. We're going to focus on a very specific use case today called securing high-value asset documents. And um, with that example, we will show how our underlying API technology is used and what is happening underneath with Fabric from both a uh, transaction processing perspective and privacy and confidentiality features around private data. And Eric will go into details associated with that. So we'll start off with just explaining the use case. We'll then go to an actual um, auto lease uh, uh, signing process and secure that auto lease on the, the blockchain from a demonstration standpoint. Then Eric will come up and talk about the specifics of what's happening uh, from a fabric perspective. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. So when we talk about high value asset documents, these are the documents that are actually securing uh, the financial interests of the institution that is loaning and, and providing the financing around uh, the purchasing of some physical uh, asset. And so if you look at the three largest verticals associated with that, that's uh, the home mortgage industry, autos, and then equipment finance. Each one of these are multi-trillion dollar a year industries, and it's the financing of these assets that drive from a digitization standpoint to a set of regulation around how you handle these documents. Because if you do not have proof of ownership of the document, uh, that provided the loan and the financing for that physical asset, you have no right legally to go secure that asset from a foreclosure or a reclamation. So it's very important that um, uh, the financial institution has the ability to get their hands on these documents, otherwise they lose their right to protect the collateral, collateral behind that document. So if we take a step back a little bit further and we look at the electronic document process, we really have three major components. One is everyone starts off with an origination. That origination is customized to the specific terms and conditions of the transaction that will be taking place. And this transaction can be business to business, business to consumer. Uh, but from the unique terms and conditions, the agreement then is electronically signed and finalized as an agreement. From that package of documents or the close, you then need to manage how those documents are treated uh, uh, post-close from a life cycle perspective. And with these financial instruments, you have the ability to securitize them. So you have the ability to sell them out to a secondary um, uh, network of investors and so on and so forth to provide a more efficient use of capital in providing financing for uh, the particular industry that, um, that you're addressing. So we'll show you and demonstrate the use of blockchain to track this process. And so we'll be gathering events and, and recording those transactions. We can then authenticate back to the specific uh, document itself. Uh, we'll manage the ownership of that between users residing in different organizations with different institutions. And then, you know, you would have the ability, if you meet the set of regulations and requirements, of then securitizing and, and send, selling that out to a secondary market or transferring the ownership of that document. And we'll show that also from a, a demonstration standpoint. So what will be used is the API software that we've developed as a company. It's all around the treatment of documents. Uh, and so, you know, we won't get into the specifics of this. If people have an interest in the leveraging of the API and the use of an API and a pr future proof of concept, you know, please come see us. Our focus here is to help with uh, the education around fabric and the in intricacies associated with that. 
Uh, one of the things we will be demonstrating, though, is we've done a custom integration with an eSign uh, piece of software. And, um, and so, you know, all of this will be integrating with existing software suites. Uh, none of this will really come uh, natively out to the industry. It'll all be um, integrated within a CRM or within uh, some type of enterprise content management platform, things of that nature. And so we'll show that integration and how it's, how it's used and leveraged. So we sit as an infrastructure technology play. Um, we sit on top of fabric. Everything we do uh, relates and leverages fabric as the underlying blockchain. And then you have applications that sit on top of us, which would be a lending platform, things of that nature. Uh, and that market is called digital transaction management, which is really just the digitization of document-centric processes. So with that, we'll get into the demonstration of an auto lease. And so we have deployed a fabric blockchain sitting out on an IBM cloud. Uh, and what we'll do is we will originate loan documents. The signing of those documents will be done by both Eric as the leasee and me as the lessor. Uh, once we sign those documents, then we'll manage and track the ownership of them and show the various capabilities around authenticating back uh, to the originals with the blockchain and, um, and, and further look at the capabilities of what can be done. And with all of these kind of demonstrations, you know, blockchain really, really sits around recording of transactions and events and then figuring out what you want to put on chain, off chain, what you want to have um, managed from a privacy and confidentiality perspective. And so what we'll be using uh, from a privacy perspective is the use of private DB, which was uh, introduced as an experimental feature in version 1.2, and then uh, GAing in version 1.3. Um, once we go through the demonstration, then Eric will show the specifics around how transactions are processed, and then how we use private data and the capability of that with respect to these documents uh, within the Fabric blockchain. So with that, I've got to go to glasses now. And um, let's see what we got here. So, first of all, what we'll what we'll we'll start with is um, this is the the uh, e-signature app that we're integrated with is a company called OneSpan. Um, think of this as DocuSign or Adobe Sign, things of that nature. And simply, what you're doing is you're going to be loading templates into the software. I have a template already loaded. That's a draft and it's to do an auto lease of a BMW, um, and we will go ahead and um, uh, start, we have, I have it already instrumented for signature, and so here's myself and Eric, and these are all instrumented for signature and signing, okay? Back here, what we have is a, um, browser interface to our server software. And, and this is the actual blockchain itself running on Fabric. We have the, the uh, full transaction list recorded uh, with, the various, um, with the various blocks of 791 blocks. So this is utilizing our document management software, which is built around packages, and packages being um, an aggregation of multiple documents. Um, so here is the auto lease BMW. Uh, we are, like I said, integrated in with the signature app, and with it, you know, we're capturing event logs and, and audit trails. We have a package create, which is what exists over here in this um, in this application. So if we now send this to sign. Uh, both Eric and I will get email notifications associated with having a document ready for signature. And this is no different than any other electronic type of closing that uh, you will experience with respect to any type of physical good purchasing of some, uh, of some value. Um, since I'm already logged in, I'll go ahead and do my signing. And it should come up and prompt me with um, the little sticky mark as to where to sign. 
So, so here we have the auto lease. It is going to uh, Eric. Eric has a personalized license plate called Fabric because he's such a fan of Fabric and the various terms and conditions associated with the lease. So I will sign it. It will automatically um, uh, date it for me. And now it's applying the digital signature associated with my signing. Okay. Yeah, you go ahead and, uh, and sign away. So if we go back now to the blockchain and we refresh, we see that we now have an activate of the package. I've signed and we will um, get Eric's signing going on. Are you signed away? And I don't know if that's, if we look at the audit trail, that'll give us the details. Each of these are written as a blockchain transaction. You know, what you see here is we've done this from a demonstration perspective. You have to make decisions on what you want to record as a transaction, what you want to pool as a set of transactions. And it's all about, you know, your use of the blockchain and where you think um, various value will, um, will be added. Uh, and so these are the audit trails associated with digital signing. Uh, you know, you have two here with the red X. It's because it had not been, the, the event which we grabbed from the signature application had not been validated to the blockchain. If we refresh, that should um, clean up to all good. Okay, so now if we go back to our list packages, here we have the auto lease BMW. We have the two documents, which were the electronic disclosures and the um, auto lease. If we go look at the actual um, document that was signed itself, we can now grab that from the private data repository associated with the various peer nodes within Fabric and um, pull up the document. And it takes a little bit of time. And so it's going to now open the PDF and it is going to show the um, actual document with the digital signatures applied by both Eric and I, time stamped uh, through the electronic software and, um, and recorded all as transactions on the blockchain, okay? With that though, we keep a full history associated with uh, the package and the signing. And this is important because you have to prove uh, in a court of law that um, this actually took place. And, and so here's the various events, the timestamps, the transactions that existed, and it should conclude with a download that took place. Okay? So now we have this document, and should Eric default on his lease payments, I have to provide proof of this document that it is secured by my institution in order to have legal right to repossess that car from Eric. Otherwise, he has a case that it was never, um, you know, I, I fully uh, handled the terms of my uh, agreement and, and uh, you do not have a right to it. So, but now I want to free up additional capital such that I can further lend to additional users. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer this asset to a pool of investors. Uh, they happen to reside over on Org3. And so before I go there, my investors are over here in this browser window. Here's my investors. Uh, they have already uh, auto leased Toyota and, and Audi. We'll just refresh and make sure there's nothing else out there. And we will go ahead then and transfer that, um, that auto lease to the investors. All of this is handled by the chain code residing on the peers. So, you know, this is very tightly managed from a security and, um, and transparency perspective. Uh, part of the, the regulation requires a two-step approach to transferring an asset. You not only transfer out, but you have to um, select and, and selectively approve the transfer in to what's called your electronic vault. So the investor pool has a transfer in request. We could actually reject this transfer 
And so then we're just saying we just don't want it. So the, the package has been rejected. If we go back here and refresh, um, it's the transfer was rejected, okay? And so um, we will then physically, then we will selectively cancel that transfer. So all of this, once again, being recorded as historical events, providing the full transparency of the um, activity on the blockchain. So transfer, reject, buy investors, and then the cancel. All right, so this time though, we're gonna transfer and we're gonna force the investors to accept this thing. And go back over here. And so we'll accept the transfer. And the asset now is owned and recorded through the investors. Once again, if we look at the event history, you know, we keep the full historical capability between um, with, the, with the final accept from the investors from, from myself. So we can also control access and usage uh, from other members. We could add a, um, uh, an, an auditor function that could look, that could provide read access to the, um, to the documents itself and, and, and so on. So um, now with the investors, one of the things that, that you know, we're gonna assume that they're um, that they require is that you have to have an insurance package associated with the um, with all of the leases, and so we're going to now add our insurance policy to our package, and now our package has been augmented with not only the signed lease and the disclosure, but the insurance policy associated with the auto lease. Okay, and so this, these are the capabilities that we've built uh, based upon our API, but what's really making a lot of this happen and what's simplifying this whole process are the capabilities of Fabric in how it is um, processing transactions and how the private data capability is being leveraged to provide full privacy and confidentiality without um, adding additional um, overhead to the blockchain itself. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Eric and he'll take you through um, what's happening underneath the, from a, um, from a uh, fabric perspective. So let me get out of his way. As Al uh, said, I'm going to go through and describe um, some of the details that goes on in Hyperledger Fabric as we, uh, as we do these transactions. First, we'll go through a, um, a transaction, uh, you know, the basic transaction flow, and then we'll, we'll take a, a another pass through it, talking about private data and how a document is handled in, in the private data case. So for the discussion, we'll use um, um, this basic picture, it shows a hyperledger fabric with two organizations, and it's made up of a bunch of nodes, which are the, the boxes there. And the blue ones, the um, P1, P2 are two peers, so each of the organizations have two peers in them. The peers have a, uh, a chain code attached, that's kind of the yellow box there with the CC, and a ledger, the, the red box. In Hyperledger Fabric, a ledger is made up of two, two pieces, a uh, world state, which is a key value pair database um, of the current, current um, information that's stored there, along with a, 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 the traditional blockchain, a hash connected blockchain. Um, each, uh, each organization has a certificate authority 
And Hyperledger Fabric has, has provided a certificate authority um, for that case. And then in the middle there is an orderer. It, uh, as, as the name might imply, it, uh, it will take the transactions, put them in blocks, and, and, and keep the order straight of those uh, transactions. And then each organization could have their own application. And then I, I've got a UI shown there. So as we're going through the demonstration, um, I'll click on different things, and, th and, th and those were requesting a transaction of some sort. And from the UI, that went to the <coughs> application. And the application will take that, uh, that request from, from the UI and use the SDK and build a, uh, a proper transaction proposal um, for it. And I'll use the um, credentials based on the user that, um, that, that did the request and actually sign that transaction proposal with that user's ID. And then it'll take that, um, um, that proposal and it'll send it to each of the peers in the network. And the peer will validate it as a proper proposal and forward that on to the uh, chain code. And the chain code at that point will do a simulation of the transaction. And the transaction is really going to be a, a function call to the chain code and some information um, in terms of arguments that will go along with that, uh, that uh, uh, transaction. And the chain code will go through and it will, um, it will simulate that transaction. And what that means, it'll go and, and read the values out of the world state that it needs to perform the transaction. And it'll come up with new results that should be written into the um, um, world state when it's all said and done. Um, but at that point, it just simulates it. It does not actually make any changes to the world state. And I'll return that back to the peers. And the peers will go through and um, it'll endorse that transaction. It's going to take and, and um, you know, validate the, the response. And then it'll use its own um, um, signature or digital, dig, it'll apply a digital signature to that, those results from the chain code. And then that, <coughs> that endorsement gets sent back to the application. And so at this point, like I was saying before, even though the chain code is done doing what it, what it, uh, its piece of this whole process, no change has actually been made to the, um, the ledger at all. And in fact, if, if the application just dropped it at this point, the ledger would, would, uh, would not be modified at all. So then the, the application will take each of those endorsements and it'll create a real transaction. They'll have the, the transaction proposal, the results from the chain code, and then this, the digital signatures from each of the, um, each of the peers. And I'll send that transaction to the orderer. And the orderer at this point will put it into a block. And it, it, the orderer doesn't do any validation. It doesn't run the, you know, it doesn't have chain code. It doesn't run any of this. It doesn't have the world state. All it does is it takes this transaction, it puts it into the block, and it puts the, the transactions in, in order in the block. And then it'll fill that block up or if, uh, if the timer goes off, it'll, um, it'll go ahead and send the, send the block at that point. And for our demonstration, we use the default values of, of 10 transactions per block or two seconds. And then the order will distribute that block out to each of the peers. And, the, um, and then the peers will go through a validation phase. And in this validation phase, the peers will check to see if there's enough endorsements on the transaction to meet the endorsement policy, and if the, um, the world state has changed since the simulation was done. Now the endorsement policy, that gets set on a tran uh, chain code by chain code um, basis. And it, um, <coughs> and you know, for you, and you, the, the writer of the chain code or the, whoever deploys the chain code can decide what they want this endorsement policy to be. In the case of this small network, you'd probably want both, both organizations to endorse um, at with at least one peer. And then also, they'll also check that the world state hasn't changed. So if, 
if a transaction comes in, you know, two transactions can be in place in the same block that happen to change the same information in the world state. And what will happen is only the first transaction that the peer um, goes through will get, get approved. That peer will update the world state and then on this, the next transaction that, that tries to make the same change to the world state or change the same, same information world state will get, um, get reject, rejected. It'll be marked as invalid. And so the peers will go through each of these transactions one by one and if they're valid, we'll update the world state for it and mark it as valid. If it's not valid or there's some conflict there, it will mark the, um, the transaction as invalid. And whether the transaction is valid or not, it stays in the block. And then w once all that's been checked, the block will be appended to the, the blockchain. That's an asynchronous process. It may take a, a couple seconds, so the application can register um, with the SDK for an event to um, uh, be notified when the transaction has been completed. And that, that event will also um, notify the application whether the transaction was successful or not. So now we'll go into the, the document flow. Everything that we just covered will be um, done as well. And then with this, we're going to add some new elements to it. And as you can see, um, we've got private data collections in use. And we've got a org one special, uh, specific to org one, the org one collection. And we've got, you know, org two's got one. Um, for itself, and then a shared one that both org one and org two have access to. And these are the private data collections that get used to, um, to, to store the document information and keep it private um, from, from those that, that don't have access to it. So go through this, we take the, uh, the, the document out of the e-signature service, bring that into the application, and we create a, a transaction just like before, except for now, there's a transient data section in that transaction that the, the document data goes into. And that transient data section gets used during the endorsement phase, but, but does not end up in the transaction that goes into the block. So this, it's a way to keep the you know, make that data available for the, the peer in the chain code during the initial phase, but, but to not have it in the, the more permanent blockchain after it's and done. So just like before, this transaction gets sent to the peer, and the peer forwards it to the chain code. And then we're going to take a closer look at what happens um, once, once we get to the, this chain code. So in the endorsement phase, the chain code will operate just as it did. And in this case, it'll have an instruction to store that, that uh, document data into the private data um, um, collection. But at this, at this point, um, can't put it into the real um, private data collection. So the, that data goes into what's called the transient data store. And I'll sit there during the endorsement and validation phase and then get used later in the validation phase if the transaction goes through. If the transaction does not go through, then it'll get cleaned up out of here after some number of blocks, which, which is a configurable um, parameter. But at this point, um, the chain code will, will uh, respond back to the peer and we'll go through the whole process we talked about before. Our peer will send it back to the um, application, the application will kit up a transaction go, that will go to the orderer and then the order will distribute it back to the peers and we come back here to the validation phase. And in the validation phase, if everything is okay with the transaction, the, um, the peer will update the world state and it will also move the transient data store into the, um, the private data um, collection. And then coming back out to the, the larger picture. So at this point, we've got the, um, um, we've got the, the document. It's in the org one collection. And 
at this point, only, only uh, org one has access to it. So a transaction that goes to um, peer or one of the peers in org one, that will be able to read that data. But if, uh, if a transaction goes to the, one of the peers in um, org two, um, it will not be able to, to read the data. And then our access control piece um, will control who ha you know, has access. And you can open up um, access to things in different orgs. But even if, that, even if um, you opened access to that document to um, a, a member of org two, they would still have to run the transaction up in org one in order to get, um, get access to the document. So during the transfer that, that we showed, the first step on the transfer was to initiate the transfer, and that was done at, by the org, org one owner of the document. And what went on behind the scenes there is, is that document got, got moved from the org one collection down to the org two collection that's shared between the two orgs. And then, Al uh, went through and, and did a reject of that by the, the new owner. And when he did that, the document, um, and he, he went back to the org one user and did a cancel. That actually moved the document back to org one, the org one collection as a transaction. And then the second time he went through, he accepted it. And that, uh, when, by accepting that, ran a transaction on the covers that moved that document down to um, the org two collection. And with that, that, that ends uh, our conversation. And so we're happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. Hang on, we gotta use the mic for that. I think it's there. So are you storing the, the documents on chain or a hash? So on, on chain is stored a hash and we store a hash and also um, fabric when it writes private data will store a, a hash as well. But the, um, but that in the private collection there, that, that's not on chain itself, it's, it's in a separate database. And so here, what you can actually do is you could run another transaction to, del to delete this data. It'll delete it out of the private data um, collection, and there'll be no record of it at, at that point. And the, the main chain just has information about the transactions and a hash of the data. Okay, and then just a follow-up question. What, what is, it a, is your content management or document management your own design, or are you using some open source uh, tool? So that was one span, you mean the, uh, the signing package? So everything's within the one span environment? So the one span was, uh, you know, another company's, and then anything with the blockchain on it was, was ours. Uh, how are the nodes set up? Who are running nodes uh, is the first question, and what's the endorsement policy? So we, um, we set the nodes up ourselves. It's, it's a, you know, for this was a, a demo setup. And so um, it's a four node, um, or four organization, two peers each was what it was on the demo. Uh, but in production, what's it going to be? I mean, where's the root of trust? So, uh, you, you know, there's, there's choices there. You know, might use the IBM Cloud um, um, or their, their blockchain service or one of the other services. And so you can also think of this as being a component of a lending platform in which each financial institution has their own set of nodes. And so you have trust within the, the usage of the lending platform across multiple financial institutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I understood that the order here is acting like a centralized entity, right? So the order, the green box there. Yeah. Okay, we're trying to avoid this, like, uh, but wouldn't this cause any issue, like, uh, if, if, you, if you just make this as a centralized, where it will distribute uh, the document to all peers? I mean, uh, the idea of 
blockchain is just to have like a decentralized, you know, uh, concept. And now here the order will be sitting in the middle. Yeah, so, you know, this is simple drawing. It's, it's here, you know, we've got a, a single order, and yeah, it's centralized in this case. But that's really an ordering service, and so you could build a, a much more complicated um, ordering service. Uh, and, and the production implementations would so do that. So what is the main role of the order here? What's that? What is the main role of the order within this diagram? The main role. Oh, the main role of the order is simply to um, keep the transact, be the authority on the, the, the blocks and what goes in the, the blocks and the order of the transactions in the block and then the order of the blocks. So every, every peer out in the system has to have the same understanding of, you know, what, which block comes first and which transactions come first in those blocks. Okay. One more question about the code chain. Uh, you stated that each peer has, like, its own code chain and will check and will validate. And if it's okay, you know, the document will be added, right? What if, like, one of the peers, like, like code chain has an issue with it? Wouldn't that be like, for example, uh, you know, the, the, the... So, so yeah, if, if, say, Peer 2 on the bottom there had a, yeah. um, um, you know, maybe its ledger wasn't up to date or something of that nature, and say it, it even went on and tried to run the simulation of the transaction, then its results would not match the other three mm -hmm. peers. And so either the application could, um, you know, the SDK in the application could figure that out and throw that that endorsement away, or if it included that endorsement, it would not it would not be correct. And so during the validation phase, when the peers look at it, it would have a bad endorsement. And then, you know, that which could be okay if your endorsement policy didn't require all four peers to be um, part of it. If it was if you only required two valid endorsements, mm -hmm. one from each organization, then you would. Um, you could stand a, uh, a bad peer in that case. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the demonstration. Um, I'm just curious, um, how are you retrieving the uh, historical data um, on, uh, on an asset? Um, typically, I would think it's more of using like composite key functions within the chain code, um, but you showed um, how there was a very um, brief history on an asset and where it went and what its latest state is. Because I think um, the, um, you can easily query the world state, but retrieving the historical data um, is, in my personal experience, has been a challenge. Yeah, so, um, so we've got a couple things there. We actually for a package, you know, we've got a more complicated data structure, and we're storing the event history and the audit um, audit trail in that package data structure. So that might be the one that, that you were you were talking about. And then the history, we're getting that from the, the history of the fabric provides. And so since we've got um, a package, it's got a key associated with that package, and we're getting the transaction history for for the package itself. And, and we're retrieving it that, that way. Uh, first, thanks for the very um, clean uh, explanation. Um, I got one question about the, let's say, cleanup job. When the document is stored in the transient data store, uh -huh. and you have a failover from the application or something, um, which part of the system will keep or will execute this cleanup job? You, you mentioned that it's configurable. So there's a um, yeah, the peer itself um, will will clean that up and delete that transient data. And it, uh, it's going to use a, a kind of a block count um, to figure out when to do that. And so like if, if it runs fine, if it moves it to the, uh, the private data, then I'll get deleted at that point. But if, if that never happens, then um, you know, when a certain number of blocks goes by, it'll get deleted out of the transient data at that point. 
So the peer itself will handle that. Uh, great demo. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, can you have you got any thoughts on channel management and you know how how the system might scale as you added more of these bilateral or multilateral participants? So. So as part of the fabric, as, as you scale this out, you know, you can set an endorsement policy where you can, you know, if, if you've got 100 peers all doing this, then you may not want all of those peers to um, endorse and run, run all of this. So you could set, you know, just 20 out of the, the 100 or something to do that, um, do the endorsement. And then, you know, with part of what uh, on the private data is, even if the peer doesn't have the private data during the endorsement, it can still get that private data um, through the gossip network. And um, if if there's a query or or you know at some point it's needed, then it can be transferred that way. So I don't know if that's if that answers your question. So I, I think he also is talking right now that we are in a single channel environment are you also asking about multiple channels and scaling out from a multiple channel perspective hmm. right so in other words you know we we don't have we've chosen to stay away from multiple channels with the work we've done uh, some of the direction that we've uh, heard from ibm is that as you get into zero knowledge proofs the need for channels um, becomes less and less, and and they tend to keep you away from a large-scale channel deployment and to focus more on the minimization of channels within your environment. So, have any of the participating organizations uh, in this uh, uh, in your software? Have any of them ever demanded that uh, they want to run their own nodes, or have you ever offered them that they run their own nodes if they have trust issues? Has that scenario ever come into being, or you just manage your own uh, blockchain infrastructure? So, you know, what I can tell you from an experience standpoint is because we're integrating with existing solution providers. Um, there's almost a fear of getting involved from a hands-on administration standpoint of your own peers and, and nodes. Um, so although they're not the ending using client, their software simply enabled, they tend to want to see that outsourced and managed and controlled by someone like ourselves or some other cloud provider or blockchain as a service provider. So, but you know, you're you're dealing with existing um, software solutions that are looking to help sell on the excitement and future value of blockchain, and, and so they want to basically, you know, walk slowly. So, any other questions? My question is regarding the transfer of ownership. Okay, uh, the document, the attachment is moved from organization one collection, private collection, uh -huh. to uh, organization two's uh, private collection. That's true. Uh, does that happen uh, as, a, as, as an atomic operation when the blocks are committed to in individual peer nodes? Or is it asynchronous because you showed that attachment moves to the the common collection, and then it moves to the organization two collection. So, so the move, yeah. So the move, the move from org one to the um, common collection is atomic, but it doesn't doesn't move. You know, you have to run a whole another transaction to move it down to org two, and then that would be an atomic. That'd be one transaction to move it down to org two, and then. But once once the, it's been initiated, the document's no longer in Org One's collection. So that's why you have to do the uh, the cancel um, if if it gets rejected by the new owner, and that cancel actually moves that document back into the Org One collection. At that point, is that okay. the okay? Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, you know, I think we're past our time, so thank you everyone for attending. Eric and I will be happy to hang around and answer any more questions. Thank you.